whether yeah, you are a faithful follower or just a newcomer, you are welcome to the Global Minds for Ukraine here at Kiev School of Economics. I'm Ivan Gomes, Academic Director of the Public Policy Program here at Kiev School of Economics, and today I'm going to be your host. And we are having an outstanding event. It is outstanding actually for two reasons. First, we are broadcasting live from the official building of Kiev School of Economics, which is not a small feat given the ongoing Russia-Ukrainian war. So you can see there are real people here, not just screens. And second reason why this is an outstanding event is actually our lecturer. Uh, actually, let's start. He is so brave that he came here to deliver a lecture, which is not a small feat, once again. And I'm having a pleasure to present Professor Madyar to you, and then he will give you a lecture. So to present Professor Madyar, I will use a non, an irregular approach. I'm not going to discuss and to provide you with a list of his academic achievements. I'll do it a little bit right later, but I'll start with some really astounding facts about him. So Professor Madyar, he, is a, he has a legacy, even embodies the legacy of Hungarian liberalism because as we can know, he is a great-grand-grand-grandson of Bertalan Semere. Bertalan Semere is a prime minister, a liberal prime minister of the 1848 Hungarian revolutionary, uh, a man who actually created, uh, for a short period of time, at that point of history, who created, recreated an independent Hungarian state. And actually, Professor Magyar, he is not only an, a man in the ivory tower of academia, he is actually a well-known and active politician. Actually, during the high days of the Alliance for Free Democrats, it's a political party in Hungary, he was a very active member of this political force. And as I said, when that political party ha had, was at the apogee of its influence, he actually assumed the office of a minister of education. And assuming this office, he actually contributed really um, significantly to the development and the um, embetterment of the higher education in Hungary. And finally, to his academic achievements, I would point out to two significant facts. First, he actually graduated and he holds a doctoral degree at Atlas Lauren University. This is the oldest higher, university, uh, higher uh, education establishment in Hungary. And now he is a research fellow at the Central European University where he actively works on research on the patrimonial politics, patronage politics, the, what he calls mafia state in Hungary and abroad. And his most famous book, actually it's not a book, it's a huge 800 pages volume. It is on the different post-communist uh, post transitions which he observed and compared all over Europe. So as you can imagine, uh, an author of 800 page book, he has much to tell you and I cannot occupy the mic any longer. So Professor Magyar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, who is coming here is so brave and, and permanently a lot of million people are living every day here. They are the heroes, not those who visit for a few days here or this part of the country where actually now in this moment there is no war but uh, I'm an admirer of the braveness of Ukrainians uh, as they fight for their liberty against uh, uh, the Russian aggression. Uh, I have to correct you, I, I was never a professor and I'm not a professor, I'm a sociologist. Before the regime change in Hungary I was not led to teach at any university after it for 20 years I was in the Hungarian parliament, a politician, and since 2010 when we had the autocratic breakthrough of the Obama regime, what I call post-communist mafia state, since that time I am not let into any Hungarian universities again. So it's, uh, uh, so it's a nice story this way. I am a sociologist, a research, research fellow now at the Central European University's Democracy Institute. With my young colleague with whom we wrote this book, Balint Modlovich, uh, our primary aim was to create a coherent language for the description of these post-communist regimes because we felt that the mainstream approach of Western politology practically 
does not understand really what happened here after the regime change in these different, uh, uh, different countries. Uh, and during the regime change, we had two types of illusions. One illusion was that it's a, a <coughs> determined process that these countries, after the collapse of the communist regime, they will transform into liberal democracies. And there is no other way. It's just a question of uh, uh, good policies. Uh, and if some of these regimes did not reach this status of liberal democracies, it's just a child disease. We just have to wait for that. And of course, it had such an illusion as well uh, that uh, you can build any kind of regime on the ruins of communist dictatorship. As a sociologist, I always felt that it's, it's, it's not the way as we can understand uh, uh, these regimes. At that time, the mainstream Western literature uh, uh, was dominated by the transitology, transitologist uh, approach. It was a kind of teleological approach, uh, which stated that uh, sooner or later uh, these regimes will be liberal democracies. The real question was that whether this just needs some time, or uh, the different, uh, uh, a huge part of these post-communist regimes reach their terminal, uh, terminal stations. Then, of course, after 10 years, about after the decade, uh, they had to realize that this transitology somehow does not work. And then it was replaced by hybridology, when they just realized that between liberal democracy and dictatorship, there's a huge gray zone for, uh, where they can find most of these countries. And, and they had to give up this teleological approach somehow. But the question was that how could they, how could they understand these regimes? And, and I just... Uh, 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 sh uh, show it uh, three, three uh, approaches, which is this gray zone is called hybrid regimes together, or uh, the other way than within this gray zone, electoral democracy, competitive authoritarianism, or hegemonic authoritarianism. And the last one, what I prefer, just makes difference between democracy, autocracy, and dictatorship. Uh, the common uh, uh, feature of these approaches that they concentrate only on the political institutions and somehow do not affect the other spheres of, uh, of uh, uh, social actions. Uh, in, the main, in the mainstream literature, you will find three hidden axioms. What I think that we have to dissolve, we have to give up if we want to understand the real nature of these uh, of these regimes what emerged on the ruins of uh, communist dictatorship in the other spheres of the uh, uh, society. Uh, uh, and according to our views, for example, the autocratic attempt of Poland uh, with the uh, leadership of Kaczynski belongs to this experience and it's very much different from that what we can have for what we have in Hungary, for example, which belongs to patronal autocracy. If you think that it can be a hierarchical one, then you introduce patronal state. But if a hierarchical network has a special sociological character of a clan, which means that it's an adopted political family, this is the term what we use for the new elite of these countries, of these countries, of the, those which belong. But the nucleus of different clan states can be not only, uh, uh, not only ethnic groups. In the case of uh, Russia, for example, it's, uh, it's uh, former KGB guys from the middle level and from the, from the GDR and from, from, uh, from uh, San Petersburg or anyway before it. Uh, 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 later, is FSB guys and with some royal oligarchs. Uh, in, in, in Hungary, it's just a, a, a bunch of young guys uh, from a fraternity house uh, with the leadership of Viktor Orban. You know, this is the nucleus of this clan, what, what was built. And in other countries, of course, they can have different, uh, uh, different uh, parts of it, but they can be still considered to be clan states. Now, if we concentrate on another dimension that uh, what this regime is doing in action, then what, what is uh, uh, behavior targeting, concerning targeting power? Then Weber's patrimonial uh, definition is renewed as a patrimonial one when they refer to the fact that uh, that uh, uh, there is an there is an appropriation of public authority for private 
uh, use for private goals. And then, when this public authority is appropriated, it's a pat patrimonial or mere patrimonial society. Now, patrimonial is used when it's, it's, it's not legitimate in that sense that civic legitimacy is declared as an official one, but still it's a patrimonial structure of what you can see in this. Uh, 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 in, the, in these regimes. If it's very much a personal one, this neo symphonic or, or, or could be used it, uh, uh, also. The third dimension is the action targeting, uh, uh, targeting common goods and other things. Then they used to <coughs> say that, okay, there are rent seeking regimes. But rent, to be a rent seeking regime doesn't mean necessarily that it's a criminal regime. It can be, a regime can be rent-seeking is absolutely an illegal way, for example, expanding uh, uh, the s positions of the state in the economy and bureaucracy, and are part in that, what is, uh, uh, they fulfill these positions with their, with their people, or even they, uh, they enlarge the size of the bureaucracy. Uh, the, uh, uh, it can be, in this sense, uh, 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 rent-seeking. When we are speaking about kleptocratic state, it means that it's already a criminal action when you practically appropriate uh, 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 public goods for your private use, not authority, but uh, goods, revenues, uh, 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 incomes, etc., from, from different uh, uh, public uh, uh, resources. But there is a further stage of this, uh, 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 of this categorization, the predatory state, when it means that you, with the help of state coercion, uh, practically grab, says, in an illegal way, uh, the assets and enterprises of other private owners. It's a different stage. Not all kleptocratic states are predatory states, but Hungary, Russia, they are predatory states at the same time. And then the, first, the, the fourth uh, dimension is the question of legality. In the legality, of course, you can say that the that, that, that state is corrupt when corruption is widespread. But corruption can be widespread without, uh, uh, without that, that we could define the whole system as a criminal state. Because if there are, these are separate actions where practically uh, voluntarily uh, 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 step in to a corrupt transaction on both sides from the public authorities and, uh, uh, and from the market, then it can be corrupt. The other thing, when a higher level, I would say, quotation mark, of this thing, when we are speaking about capture state, then uh, some criminal groups or some uh, oligarchic forces, they uh, uh, try to build up permanent uh, chains of dependency, blackmailing and, uh, and bribery towards uh, uh, public officials. But, but these are parallel, parallel chains uh, upward. And when we are speaking about criminal state, it means that uh, the governance is operated as a whole, as a criminal organization. And this is the case in Hungary and Russia and some Central Asian countries. So the traditional forms of corruption, which will be later also in this lecture, uh, can be even diminished as unnecessary thing when you capture the whole state by a political enterprise and they transform it into, a, into the operation of a criminal, uh, criminal organization. And if these four things, if you can say for a regime that it's a clan state concerning its actor, it's a you know, patrimonial state concerning the, the uh, targeting power, if you can say that it's a predatory state uh, uh, in uh, relation of, uh, of uh, uh, grabbing the uh, assets and uh, enterprise of uh, other owners and from the legalities uh, that it's a criminal state, altogether then we call it a mafia state. Mm -hmm. So it's not a journalism. Mafia here is an, uh, as such a criminal organization which, which uh, characterizes the whole governance, whole governance, and has the form of such informality of this, uh, of this uh, people ruling that, uh, uh, ruling that regime, uh, which has the characteristic of an extended uh, uh, extended patriarchal family or clan. Now if we go through, then we can, uh, <coughs> uh, concerning the actors, uh, the literature likes to speak about elites. But when you use this word elite, it doesn't mean anything. 
practically, uh, you, you cannot catch it. What, what is the real character? What, 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 what kind of structure it has? What are the, uh, what are the sociological features of, of Egypt? You know? And then they use, use the, always something like a class. New class, new ruling class. But it's not a class at all. What we have or what Russia has is not a class at all. Because in a class, uh, you do not have personal dependency. It's an unpersonal relation just based on, 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 on financial and material differences in the society and those differences whether you are an employee or an employer, etc., etc. But these are not personal dependency. When they try to focus on personal dependency, they say that it's a feudal or not feudal uh, 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 elite what they have. But the feudalism was a legal system. It had a, it had a legitimacy and it was a, leg it, it, it was a legal system. Uh, uh, now, it's, uh, now it's not the case. There, and sometimes they use that it's an nomenclatura. But the nomenclatura was the registry of political and economic positions. Uh, which was filled up with individuals and not with families, even you had to, def uh, to deny your family ties and, and, uh, and such a way showing your uh, loyalty towards the bureaucracy, towards the bureaucracy and bureaucratic, uh, uh, bureaucratic apparatus. So we use the word that in a patron autocracy, the form of uh, of the ruling elite is an adopted political family. It's a clan type because the network extends of personal acquaintances, and this is uh, as adopted political family and political economic clan is uh, built up. These uh, uh, <coughs> new and new families are adopted, and not on an individual base, but on a family base. And it's not necessary to belong to the uh, elite that you should be a party member of the ruling party because the ruling party practically in these regimes is a transmission plan party and not a real political party. Uh, uh, the adopted political family extends over the formal institutions. It has a patronal loyalty, and which means like in a mafia, uh, like in a mafia that, that, um, that uh, uh, it is, there is no free entrance here you can be adopted, and there is no free exit from here, uh, uh, from these positions. And of course, it's a merger of political and economic uh, resources, and as I mentioned, that it uh, uh, follows the cultural patterns of rule of the patriarchal family or clan. Now, when we are speaking about that the society is patronal or non-patronal, then, then we can make also uh, <coughs> distinctions in four categories, which means that what does it mean uh, uh, <coughs> that a uh, society, a regime, would be seen uh, uh, and characterized by patronal characters, by patronalists? One is that the uh, formal institutions are replaced mainly by informal institutions. Of course, it's not, it's not very definitely for all institutions. It, it means uh, the dominant forms of rule are, and the central decisions are brought in informal, in informal institutions. This is why I say, for example, that, that, uh, that uh, not the formal government governs these countries, not just the president or the presidential committee, but it's uh, like a chief patron's court. When a court is uh, consisted of people having formal and informal positions together, they are practically invited. Of course, there are some uh, uh, formal procedures through elections, through, uh, uh, through cheated elections, etc., etc., so, uh, as they, as they uh, uh, try to collect some part or uh, set up some part of this uh, uh, score, but there are a lot of people there without any formal position. Uh, the normative regulations are replaced by discretionary regulations. The authorization uh, of the line they operate which uh, uh, were characterized in a non-patronal society or non-patronal regime by collective and corporate authorizations are replaced by personal one. And the command and the dependency chains uh, uh, from bureaucratic and institutional ones, formalized one, into client personal chains. Uh, 
If these characteristics, the informal dysfunctional personal and clientele exchange, uh, characterize a regime, then we could say that it's a kind of patronal, patronal regime. Of a liberal democracy is a typical non patronal regime. Now, if we are uh, speaking about the predatory state and, and, and uh, 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 what kind of people one has uh, in these countries, the main problem is that, uh, that, uh, 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 that when we say that the socialist system, which was characterized by planned or common economy, was replaced by the capitalist system, but the capitalist in itself does not say too much. Uh, we thought that it would be important to make a difference between uh, relational economy and market economy. Uh, uh, now we turn to the categories of Kalpolani about the different uh, integration schemes or coordinating mechanisms. Uh, he set up three categories of, uh, of market coordination, uh, uh, redistribution, and reciprocity. We do not deal now with reciprocity. He told that all of these uh, coordinating mechanisms uh, are present in any historical regimes, but the question is which is the dominant one. Uh, until now, normally, so we saw that the, uh, in a capitalist system, the market coordination is the dominant one. But uh, uh, we made a separation within the category of redistribution and made the difference between relational market redistribution and bureaucratic resource redistribution. Bureaucratic resource redistribution characterized the communist regimes, the planned economies, common economies. While in a uh, patron autocracy, especially in the criminal states, relational market redistribution is the dominant form and not the free market coordination, which means that contrary to the market coordination, which is regulated in person, normative, and dominant, uh, 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 contrary, uh, the relational market redistribution is non formalized, personal, and discretional. But this is the huge difference. And if we see the relation between uh, uh, the members of the political elite, uh, uh, instead of politicians, I use the word, we use the word oligarchs in these patriarchal societies, which, uh, which reflects the fact that they have a visible political power, but an invisible economic one, and their relation to oligarchs, which are just the inverse of this category, which says that uh, if they have a visible economic power, is an invisible uh, political one, then you see that that, uh, uh, that economy is dominated not by clear market mechanism, but much more on the relational market redistribution. And this is the huge difference. Uh, practically, the invisible hand of the impersonal market forces is replaced, or instead of them, you can see the very visible hand of the patron, of the chief patron interfering with market forces. Uh, <coughs> when we are speaking about predatory state, then, then we can see uh, 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 and use the category of corporate trading. It's nice that the, the Russian category right there, which is coming from the English one, it's used very much, and it says that you is, uh, with the help of state uh, coercion, you take away, in an illegal way, uh, uh, the assets, enterprises of, of other private, uh, other private owners. It has four main categories concerning that who are the initiators of this. And at the beginning of this transition, the organized underworld criminal groups were uh, the dominant force in this. And at that time, it was the black trading uh, uh, accompanied by a weak state. It was characterized mainly for the oligarchic uh, anarchy uh, uh, period of, uh, of Russia's history after uh, 91. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, it was accompanied by rival entrepreneurs or oligarchs uh, who used also criminal, uh, criminal means uh, 
to sales uh, uh, enterprises of others, but uh, uh, they already utilized uh, the so-called uh, means of gray rating, which means that the lower and middle level of the state apparatus could be used in this uh, criminal blackmailing activity to the, of the raiders of, of, of corporate trading. And uh, as we go up, then uh, as an initiator or client of the corporate trading, lower middle level public authority itself can happen. And at the end, uh, when we are speaking and we have a criminal state, then it means that the organized upper world, not the organized underworld, organized upper world, the chief patron, the top level public authority, is the, is the main raider, the main predator. He organizes, he organizes the predation. Uh, the, uh, it can happen only if there is a single pyramid power network where the, where the uh, uh, power is monopolized uh, uh, and not, uh, you face not state capture by oligarchs, but you face oligarchs capture by a criminal, by a criminal state. And uh, uh, what is the process of, 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 of right there, so, you know, uh, 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 if we uh, would like to see that, that uh, how does it work, it's, uh, it is very much similar to a hunting process. When, uh, when a beast, a lion or anything like, want to hunt down from a herd the most vulnerable uh, species uh, and, uh, and, 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 and to grab it. So it can have three phases. The stalking phase, when you look at the prey and you estimate that uh, whom can you catch, then the hunting phase and the consuming phase. And it happens with these enterprises. You just there and, and, and this is, if you see that what is the market value of the given enterprise, we introduce the category, the market, unmolested market value. You will see there in the, the, uh, in the left side of the slide. Unmolested market value, which means unmolested that uh, uh, without state interference, without the blackmailing, blackmailing uh, predatory character of the state, how normally, how much be the value of an enterprise. But, uh, but the predator is thinking about it, okay, that with the help of state coercion, how can I blackmail and, and ruin that company? And if I say that company, uh, 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 what kind of value it could have with the help again within the relational market economy, and that is the uh, that is the uh, molested value of the company as what can I reach push down the real value and the forecasted value that what happens if I say it and then uh, a concerted action of state organizations start to hunt down certain enterprises. Well, Putin invited his oligarchs, you know, and 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 he says the, the two. The commercial TV channels. Uh, 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 again, uh, uh, Khodorkovsky's uh, uh, assets in oil industry, etc. And the others, they told for the others that if you behave well and, 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 uh, and you do not want to play a political role, then, then it will be my favor to let you in your, pro to use your property. But of course it means, it means in that case, that the, that you are not a real owner in a Western sense because the chief patron anytime can get rid of you from your property. And then the consuming phase, when with the help of relational economy, you know it's a booty value at the time when you say the prey, uh, uh, says the prey that uh, uh, there are special uh, state supports um, uh, changing the regulations, uh, 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 discretionary the normative regulations in the favor of the new owner, of the new oligarch uh, 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 having uh, public procurement, uh, uh, public procurement supporting supporting this uh, 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 new enterprise. So we can uh, have to speak in these countries about the amplitude of the arbitrariness what could be used. When I'm speaking about a corrupt state, it just uh, relatively narrow personal relation in a corruption transaction. In the communist times, when, I, uh, when we were waited for LADA, you know, for four years, and then we got a yellow one, and we became mad, you know, that why a yellow one? Then it could happen that we could bribe somebody to have a red one or to have a blue one, you know? It's a, it's, it's, it's a single corrupt relation. Uh, uh, that bureaucrat had the competency only 
giving another lata, but not to go to other fields of, uh, of economy or, or doing other favors. It's a core, it can be a core upset. But when a state is captured, then it can happen that, for example, in the, when a oligarchy groups capture a local community, then there are a lot of other actions in which uh, 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 they can decide together and, and concertedly uh, uh, exercise uh, coercion on the owner to say it's their property. But the biggest is the amplitude of arbitrariness in a criminal state. Criminal state. When you at the same time, uh, uh, you can give an offer, uh, even as a minister, to, a, uh, to an owner of an enterprise to sell his uh, enterprise on a low price to a friendly oligarch, to a stooge who belongs to this, uh, the layer of oligarchs. If he resists, then you can use the uh, state attorney's, uh, chief attorney's office tax office, uh, uh, different uh, uh, environmental protection uh, 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 authorities, health authorities, etc., etc. You have lot, And you can use it concertedly only from the top. Who is in this position that they could mobilize all these organizations which are uh, formally independent from each other, autonomous organizations? This is a chief patron in a patron autocracy, in a criminal state. And this is what's happening in Hungary, and this is what's happening in, in Russia and in Central Asian uh, post-Soviet regimes uh, as well. Now, therefore, we were not too much interested in the, in the traditional forms of corruption, you know, what we call, and, the, and I won't tell the whole uh, uh, slide it uh, uh, to you, uh, which we call that's free market corruption, when you can overbid with a bigger bribe uh, the other competitor in a corruption market. You know, it's a, it's a free market corruption, as we call it. Uh, but in the case of uh, criminal state, it's, it's coercive, centralized, vertically top-down, monopolistic, permanent and general uh, vessel chains uh, operates these uh, uh, corrupt transactions. And not the kickback money what characterizes these corrupt transactions, but protection money. In most of the cases, for example, when local authorities make some favor, do some favor for the chief patron in, in public procurement for, for a, a crony or for, a, uh, uh, for somebody from their family or even adopted family, they do not get any money. They are rewarded with their positions, that they can retain their position, and in the next cycle, uh, they will be the official candidates of the uh, uh, ruling uh, dominant, uh, uh, dominant force. Therefore, uh, I uh, do not like the term, for example, that uh, uh, the crony capitalism, because the crony supposes that there are, there are uh, autonomous persons doing in the same status, one, of, one from the economy, the other from the uh, political sphere, uh, engaged in their corrupt transactions, but they can freely leave after a single corrupt transaction uh, uh, this position and go to another and do other businesses. In a, in a patron-client society, in a uh, patron-autocracy, it's not the case. You, cannot, uh, you are not an independent, autonomous person in these uh, 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 corrupt businesses. Uh, <coughs> therefore, <coughs> if we hear uh, uh, when there are the political capitalisms, uh, different definitions or different names, uh, we can make a difference between crony capitalism, oligarchic capitalism, patronal capitalism, and mafia capitalism. In the mafia capitalism, the dominant form of corruption is the criminal state, not a partial state capture. Uh, the, the initiating actor, the adopted political family in a monopolistic position of power itself, and what is captured is not only the market, but market, the state, and oligarchs. They are captured all and, and, and centralized in one, uh, 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 one thing. And this table somehow summarizes the, 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 uh, some of the former, uh, former ones as well. Now, let's go from this point of view to the, uh, to the different trajectories of post-communist post regimes. The problem is that the, the mainstream literature uh, uh, investigating the, 
only the political sphere separately as an autonomous sphere without the interference with its patronal character, its patronal character to other spheres of social actions, they just they just uh, measure whether a country is uh, closer to liberal democracy or closer to uh, different type of dictatorship from this point of view. But we separated now two levels, two levels of, uh, of characterizing. So the, the uh, <coughs> and use some examples uh, and separated four uh, uh, primary trajectories of post-communist regimes. One is when for, for example, the case of Estonia, Poland, and Hungary in the early 90s, I'm speaking about the early 90s, in the case of Estonia, even until now, but in the two other countries not, that what happened that from a communist dictatorship, it became a liberal democracy, and at the same time, from a single pyramid bureaucratic patronal regime, a multi-pyramid non-patronal one. In the second category, which uh, the most of the post-communist uh, regimes belong, for example, Romania, Ukraine as well, from a communist dictatorship, you have a patronal democracy. They never were liberal democracies because from a single pyramid, bureaucratic patronal network, patronal regime, it was transformed into a multi-pyramid informal patronal, informal patronal regime. And then, like uh, Central Asian countries where they 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 cannot be characterized as even as uh, uh, patronal democracies, uh, uh, like Kazakhstan, you know, they directly went from a, from a communist dictatorship to a patronal autocracy, practically. Even the old staff uh, uh, changed suits and, uh, and got in these new positions. And from a single pyramid bureaucratic patronal uh, regime into an informal patronal regime. And the fourth one, which is not a regime change, that model change, the case of China, when it became a communist dictatorship, from a communist dictatorship, a market exploiting dictatorship, but it remained a single pyramid bureaucratic patronal regime in both, uh, both systems. But these are not the final stages necessarily of these countries. Therefore, we can have a look at the so called secondary trajectories of these post communist regimes. And we see that what happens. Poland is going towards the direction of a conservative autocracy. It means that from a multi-pyramid non-patronal regime to a single pyramid, towards a single pyramid patronal, non-patronal regime. While Hungary, uh, uh, first patronal democracy, then patronal autocracy, at the end, you know, in the case of Hungary, from a multi-pyramid non-patronal regime, it became a single pyramid informal patronal regime, a patronal autocracy from liberal democracy. So these are these regime changes, what we can see, or even from a patronal democracy like Russia, <coughs> it can be transformed into a, into a patronal autocracy, uh, and it has a cyclical, cyclical character. And now, I would like to uh, 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 go to the interactive model, what we had, uh, what we had uh, on the website of our book. It's a 3D, 3D model where we made difference uh, in, in different dimensions, what you can see on the left side of these slides, in, this, in these three categories. So we can, uh, <coughs> we can go from one to another. <coughs> this is the traditional division of uh, uh, oh, actually, Traditional, traditional division of uh, different regimes uh, according to liberal democracies, elec electoral democracies, competitive and hegemonic authoritarian regimes, and closed authoritarian regimes. But you see that some, some of the regimes which can belong to the hegemonic authoritarian regimes, they can be even very far in other respects from each other. From each other. And then uh, in, different, uh, 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 in different dimensions, we divided this triangle of the regimes, multi-pyramid power network or single pyramid power network. It says whether what is the uh, character of the power, it has a limited nature, unconstrained or totalitarian. The next one is the formality of institutions, form, which is the dominant one, formal one, semi-formal or informal one. Patronalism of rule, you know that non-patronal, bureaucratic patronal, informal patronal is the dominant one. 
uh, <coughs> what is the situation in the case of ruling parties, you know, uh, in liberal democracies and even in conservative, uh, democr conservative autocracies, these are politicians' parties uh, following much more some ideologies. While in patronal democracy and patronal autocracy, it's vessels' parties. The old <coughs> in the old Soviet system, they are cadres' parties. And what is very important, what is the do dominant form uh, uh, of economic mechanism and, and, and of property, you know? The politician wants to have some money in his, uh, uh, for his political campaign that he should be re-elected. In a patron autocracy, it's not the case. And of course, in the communist dictatorship, you have a bureaucratic resource redistribution uh, and the dominance, of, uh, uh, the dominance of state property. And there, concerning corruption, has three characteristics. One is that in a liberal democracy or even a conservative democracy, the corruption is system destroying. They can fight against it. In a, in a uh, uh, communist dictatorship, uh, among the sit uh, situation, in the situation of a uh, uh, general shortage economy, you know, it's a system lubricating corruption. They let it otherwise to assert they control it and they let it because otherwise the system does not work. It cannot work. But only for until that level. Of course, there are when, uh, when they cannot control really, but then they are uh, the political cleansing, etc., etc. And the third one for patronal uh, autocracy is system constituting corruption. It's not a deviancy, it's a system constituting element. To be corrupt in our system, in Hungary, in Russia, in Central Asian uh, countries, it's, it's, it's not a case that uh, you could lose your position. It's necessary. If you are not corrupt, you cannot be blackmailed. If you cannot be blackmailed, you cannot be a stable part of a patron-client chain, a patron-client network. This is the, and if we make difference in ideology, you know, see, then we see that, that liberal democracies are ideologically neutral. The regimes, of course, representatives of different ideologies are fighting with each other. Uh, while the conservative autocracy and communist dictatorship is ideology driven, uh, uh, while the patronal autocracy and partly patronal democracy is ideology applying. What is the real difference between ideology driven and ideology applying? That in the case of ideology driven, uh, uh, you have a value coherence of your ideology. And, and you can measure whether a regime is ideology driven or not, but whether they are ready to pay the price of maintaining this value coherence. For example, Kaczynski's regime is an ideology-driven regime. He has several campaigns against abortion, in spite of the fact that I think he knows well that it's not a very popular thing. And there is a vast, wide uh, resistance against this. But he, he thinks seriously that he is uh, uh, against abortion. In an ideology-applying regime, there are different ideological panels used by the chief patron. They, are, they do not have a value coherence. They have a functionality coherence, just a functionality coherence, because they have the um, uh, twin uh, motivation in a patron autocracy, in a mafia state. One is concentrating political power, and the other is, uh, the other is uh, to... Uh, <coughs> uh, to accumulate personal wealth for the adopted political family. This is the twin uh, motivation. In the case of Poland, uh, uh, Kaczynski's Poland, it's, uh, uh, the twin motivation is cooperating with their ideology of the society. But it's, but it's not. So Kaczynski is just an autocrat, not a criminal. Our autocrat is a criminal according to the existing uh, uh, law, according to the uh, uh, criminal code of, uh, of uh, our countries. In the case of Orban, let us say, it, it, it can happen that on the same day, uh, uh, before noon, he has an anti-migrant campaign uh, uh, telling us that the Muslim migrants are raping our uh, uh, wives and, uh, and daughters, you know, and, and uh, they uh, take away the jobs of Hungarians, etc., etc. They destroy our culture before noon. And in the afternoon, having a speech for, for, for Muslim businessmen, we, 
with whom they have personal uh, corruption ties that in the history we learned a lot from the Islam culture and, and it's so important for us and that uh, the Turks were stationing for one and a half, uh, one and a half centuries in Hungary. Uh, it just was very fruitful for both cultures, you know. So, and, 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 and uh, when the uh, critical approach towards this that what a contradiction, it's not a contradiction. He's an ideology applying guy. It's, it, it's not an ideology driven, driven regime. But he pretends to be conservative politician. It's a pre Yes, he uses labels, you know. He uses labels. The, the same thing with Christianity and, 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 and with national. Well, uh, uh, in the case of Christianity, I used to say that he was the closest to God when he, when he kicked his football ball into the, into the garden of a church and he had to jump over the fence and to get it out. That was the moment in his life when he was uh, the closest to, uh, to God. You know? or, or when uh, nationalism and national sovereignty and autonomy of the nation is nothing else, nothing else than the impunity of a, of a criminal's, criminal regime. You know? of a criminal organization. Because otherwise, if Hungary would join to the chief attorney's office, uh, 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 the European attorney's office, then it would be an existential threat, uh, practically for this whole patron client pyramid for them. Because according to the valid Hungarian uh, criminal code, they could be punished and sentenced, you know? So theref therefore, he says that, that, uh, that uh, uh, we defend our special, our own culture, we are autonomous, etc. So see, this is the difference. So uh, along these lines, we can make difference between these things. Now, if it's, I don't know whether it will work or not. I think it isn't going to. It's not go, it's going, going to do so. So in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of, uh, let's see, in the secondary, uh, uh, in that group which belongs to patronal autocracy, patronal democracies. You will find such countries like uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Moldova, uh, North Macedonia, Ukraine, uh, uh, Georgia, to some extent. They have, their trajectories have a cyclical character. Cyclical character. What means that in a, in a, in a patronal democracy, one political force says is the political power, but not the monopoly of political power. It's not a, sim not a single pyramid patronal network, but a multi-pyramid patronal network that only one of these are in power. And then uh, they feel the drive, how should they monopolize their power? And there is, they start a kind of autocratic attempt. But they cannot finish it because there are still strong institutional guarantees why it could not be done. There are two such things, two main things. One is the proportionate election system, which hampers that one political force could say a super majority in the parliament and just as a single force uh, change the constitution, have a new constitution, etc. The second is mainly the divided executive power. When, uh, when with different ways, weights, but the uh, president of a country normally uh, directly elected, and the government and the prime minister both has some of the executive power. This does not lead to, to fulfill this autocratic attempt to have uh, and to reach the status of autocratic breakthrough. And what happens, uh, and happened in Ukraine about some other countries, then this uh, Orange Revolution, the Maidan Revolution is nothing else, just just against these autocratic attempts, but autocratic breakthrough was not reached. This is why they could turn back. But this redemocratization process is not accompanied by an anti-patronal transformation. The oligarchic character of the society remains the same because some oligarchy groups even support the democratic forces. And it gives a permanent cyclical character of their regime trajectories. Uh, in some countries, this character is smaller, like in Romania or in some other countries, they are at the very edge of, of, of reaching a breakthrough position, like in North Macedonia or Moldova, etc. In this case, in this case, like, like in Ukraine also, these autocrats had to flee from the country. Yanukovych uh, uh, from Moldova, Plahotniuk uh, from North Macedonia, Gruevsky, they have to flee from the country because they were corrupt on such a level, but 
just because they could not reach the autocratic breakthrough and from this to start the consolidation phase of their regime, uh, they have to flee. What happened in Hungary that, uh, that we had an autocratic breakthrough, a successful autocratic breakthrough in 2010 because with 53% of the votes, Orban says 67% of the seats in the parliament, they adopted a new constitution alone. They uh, changed the election law several times, few hundred, few hundred times, few hundred places from uh, election to another election. In the next election in 2014, they seized only 44% of the votes, but even with the 44% of the votes, they could retain 67% of the seats in the parliament because they changed the election law uh, for their favor. So it was an autocratic breakthrough in 2000, 2010. And since that time, there is the, there is the autocratic uh, consolidation, which means that the state capture, the capture of the political institutions, is followed by a societal capture. When they capture the economy, capture the cultural sphere, they capture the education, uh, uh, universities, capture the media, media, etc., etc. It's going on. This is, this is why it's very difficult to know that how could you get out from an autocratic, uh, from a patron autocracy, how could you change it back? And even if it's very tiring to live in a patron democracy, because most of the uh, participants are corrupt political participants, etc. And you see that it's a ma, that it's all the time. It's, but still, uh, 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 the basic, uh, basic rights are still there because none of the patron client networks is in a monopolistic, uh, monopolistic position. And this is imp the real question now in the case of Ukraine, that whether this uh, war against the Russian aggression and uh, the centralization of power practically, which is accompanied by, how will it be used in the case of the patronal character of the society? What happens with the oligarchs and oligarchic clans and oligarchic, uh, uh, oligarchic ties to, to the political power? Whether the old oligarchic structure, structure could be regained again, or new oligarchs uh, will appear uh, when some of the old ones' assets are destroyed and built around the president, or the president will have a power in the parliament to, uh, to use this uh, uh, new heroic war, uh, not only for democratization, but to reach an anti-patronal transformation as well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and as a moderator, I'll start with a couple of questions. And then I think in case the audience would like to, we'll also pass them the imagined, imagined microphone. And uh, I have actually a number of questions, but I'll stick to two of them. One is like a bad one and another one like a good one. And I said a bad one, let me explain. Uh, scientists, we scientists, we tend to be skeptics. And I mean, when we hear something, we always, always tend to actually to question it. And what I'm going to question in the model you presented us is actually its iconoclastic nature. Because the very first slide, uh, the very first uh, sentence you provided us with was actually, there is a mainstream and it is to be changed. But uh, listening to your presentation and the model, actually the question about the iconoclastic nature, uh, it emerged and it only grew, in, in my mind at least. What I'm trying to say is the following. Um, there is a huge, liter huge literature on clientelism in uh, post-Soviet, post-communist states, starting with Kitschout and going on to contemporary studies. There is a huge literature on patronal networks and uh, I think we can, could both say, say that actually Henry Hale is like a kind of uh, either a partner in crime for you or maybe a guy whom you are competing with. Uh, and finally, there is a very well-known concept of neopatrimonialism. And here is what I'm driving to. Uh, we scientists, uh, we love models, we love theories, but when there are too many theories, actually some are redundant. And Please convince me that instead of a well-entrenched notion of neopatrimonialism, which actually describes the very peculiar relations when there are patronal networks and those clientelist dependencies, uh, and 
they actually mutate into the state. So please explain me why should we scientists opt for a matter state? With Harry Hale, uh, uh, I'm even personally in a uh, strong uh, professional connection, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we use very much his book, Patronal Politics. So he belongs to that stream, what we represent as well. Uh, what we try to do when you are speaking about clientelism, patronalistic character, non patrimonial, etc., then what I wanted to show that, that uh, 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 a lot of researchers who use this, they are using these categories without clear definition and without, uh, 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 with acronym class for different phenomena uh, uh, to cover. What we wanted to create with this book, uh, just uh, uh, to have a coherent language for that. This language, uh, I, what I felt until now, that uh, uh, as we are going closer and closer uh, 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 to patron autocracies in, in post uh, among the post-communist regimes, uh, it's uh, more and more better accepted than the traditional Western uh, Western approach. Uh, I had uh, uh, well, I had a chance and, uh, that to live in, in, in different regimes, you know, in a, in a uh, hard communist system, a, 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 a soft communist regime, a, a liberal democracy, a patriarchal democracy, a patriarchal autocracy, so a post-communist mafia state. So I think that uh, <coughs> these personal experiences are very much necessary for for for. Uh, for using this model and to reach uh, to reach such a model, uh, the, this book uh, had already uh, uh, was published in different languages: uh, uh, English originally, then Hungarian, then Russian. During the Russian aggression, it was a very brave move from the publishing house that they published it. Uh, now the Spanish edition is uh, going on. Uh, it uh, it is translated already the Romanian language, and the shortened version. Uh, uh, which was published in uh, English and Hungarian until now. It will be published for German and uh, Polish and uh, now next year to Ukrainian as well. So uh, uh, what I feel that, that uh, uh, this language can be used uh, uh, for those phenomena what characterizes this society coherently, coherently. Uh, because even the categories definitely uh, differently exist, they uh, they do not uh, uh, cover the whole phenomenon. When you were mentioning uh, neo patrimonialism, you know, then we think that okay, okay it has a relevance the category, but uh, but a constrained relevance, uh, which just deals with uh, uh, with the action f appropriation of public authority. But it does not say too much about the other things, about what is the real uh, uh, structure of the uh, real structure and characteristic of the ruling elite, uh, uh, what is its relation to legality uh, as a whole, what are the differences. This is what we wanted to bring together in this language. Oh, but actually, that is the point I'm driving home. Because uh, if we dive into the theory of neo-patrimonialism, we actually see that they, I mean, contemporary authors. I don't mean like Nicholas Mandervale or. Uh, According to me, uh, uh, according to our model, a criminal state is, is the word corruption. Does not describe the situation. It's not corruption. Even a traditional mafia is not corrupt because a traditional mafia. Let, let's take a traditional Italian mafia. When, of course, it's corrupt when he wants to blackmail or bribe politicians. Otherwise, those who belong to this uh, under the rule, you know, they, there is no corruption. They pay uh, protection money. They monopolize, monopolize uh, 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 the protection business there, and this is what's happening. And what we say that a mafia state is practically such a protection organization, protection organization, and it's not in a traditional sense corrupt organization. Just the word corruption is totally misleading. And all the categories you can, uh, you, well, when you are speaking about elections, for example, uh, we fought a lot with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Western experts who, who definitely like to use the uh, 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 category of free but not fair elections, you know? And we see that the elections what we have in Hungary, they are not 
they are, cannot be described with this category because, because they are not free at all. Because uh, not that is the problem, that in the given moment when you go to the ballot box, whether you can express what you can, the problem is that what happens before and around these elections, and therefore these are misleading. But so the language, what they use, uh, a lot of categories otherwise for, they are used in liberal democracies, they cannot work here, you know, cannot work here. And of course, those one which are used, that is patronage, now patrimonial, uh, rent seeking, kleptocratic, for example, they use the kleptocratic word for, for everything. What is, well, a predatory state is, uh, a kleptocratic state is not definitely predatory. This is what I wanted to show. A rent seeking state, of course, is not definitely kleptocratic or predatory. And they do not make co coherently these distinctions among, among the categories. Okay. How about the novelty, what you are capturing? Uh, novelty. novelty yes. I mean, actually, if you look on the contemporary Cameroon, or maybe the Mexico during the Santa Ana dictatorship, or maybe going even further back into history to the Henry IV, uh, the Henry the Bolingbroke in England, you actually see many similar uh, features you pointed to. Yes. I mean, clientelistic relations, Power and ownership are actually fused, and someone who has power, he, he can dishonor other people. So you, you can see it throughout the history, something which Barry Weingast called the nature, nature state. So what I'm asking, what is the novelty that kept into the model? And now I'm just turning it into its head, because the topic of your book is that post-communist transitions, they actually breeded this kind of relations. And if you go into history, we actually see that it is not about post-communist transitions. That kind of relations is uni universal. Okay, but when I speak about, when we speak about post-communist mafia, say, like I say, then we with post-communist, we, uh, um, uh, we want to emphasize that, that uh, uh, what happened with those societies who once were communist ones, for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, 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 com comparative character of, of, of these uh, of these societies it's it's a, it's a, it's a well very good thing that they started from the same corner their trajectories and of course we were asked several times that whether these could be used in for non for not post communist regimes but for other third world regimes the real question is that that what are those axioms what we did not have to dissolve for that, that this, a similar model, not exactly that one, could be used for other ones. I would like to mention two things. Uh, for example, we did not have to dissolve that axiom that the state is a capable organization. It's functioning. It's, the question is that it, whose interest it represents. You know, so that is the question. But when you go to a third world country, then you can see that there are failed states and other things. So we did not have to use this, uh, with this uh, uh, deal with this problem. Uh, and other such an axiom, what we did not have to uh, abolish or solve, is that the that the formal formal appearance or representative of this patronal power has the form of uh, political parties. But there are military dictatorships, there are, uh, there, there are theocratic regimes. Uh, uh, th then we should not say that, that, that they could be easily fit into this model. So therefore, even it was a very difficult task for us because of the lack of real experience that how to incorporate the post-communist countries. It would be an other job in the future uh, uh, what we of course uh, plan with my colleague and with others just uh, 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 to, s to have a look that, uh, that how could we expand this model for the post-colonial uh, African states or for Latin America, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I have a question about like other implication of the model you suggested. And uh, you referred several times, you put into comparison Hungary and Russia, and you pointed to some really pretty impressive similarities in their uh, interrelated relations, into the way they t tackle business. So <coughs> the internal politics in Russia and Hungary are quite similar. 
What about the, their foreign policy? Well, we in the book uh, separated uh, different levels, different levels of uh, analysis, and what we did mainly in in uh, three quarter of the book is practically that we emphasize the regime specific features, but there are country specific features, and 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 other uh, age specific features also what could be uh, used. What I say when they uh, when they used to mention as a as a criticism towards our model that okay, but uh, Russia is really very different from Hungary. That uh, that uh, even before the regime changes, uh, uh, they were different. The Soviet Union and Hungary, but both were communist dictatorships. The difference was that our was a soft communist dictatorship. Russia was a hard communist dictatorship. Or when they compare Romania and Hungary, both were characterized by a one-party system and the dominance. Of uh, uh, or the monopoly of state ownership, of state ownership. These are the these are the regime-specific features, and of course, <coughs> there are uh, uh, there are country-specific features and policy-specific features as well. Because even countries which belong to the same category, same category like patriarchal democracies, one of them can be even successful in this model, while the other not. This depends on. Uh, policy specific features like for example as Hungary was uh, a, a communist dictatorship like in Poland uh, uh, during before the regime change but the standard of living in Hungary was much higher at that time than uh, than in Poland this was the result not because the regime specific features were different but policy specific features were different and the problem is when these these levels these layers are mixed all the time then comes the endless storytelling. The endless storytelling. What about you want? Uh, OK, so, so, so you have to tell the whole thing. You do not have a category that it's a tree or it's, uh, or it's a flower. You have the category that I see something brown here going towards the, towards the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, towards the sun and some green things, but it's not so green as the other one because I do not have the word leaf, you know? So, so it's, uh, what we try to create is a kind of Mendeleev table of categories with which you can build and characterize the regimes themselves and then to tell the rest of the story because as we made this uh, uh, comparison of regime trajectories, it could not be done with a clarified Specification of the categories, what you use for the description of these uh, of these regimes. Well, actually, I was inviting you to consider the similarities because if you observe the foreign policy of Russia, of yes. Hungary, of other patronal autocracies, you can actually see some similarities which I would attribute actually not to the country specificity or policy or policy specificity, but actually to regime specificity. I mean. Not really, not, 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 not really, not definitely, because, because, <coughs> because uh, Hungary's poli uh, politics policy now concerning the uh, uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, war, you know, that uh, it differs very much from the, uh, uh, from the rest of Europe and the Western world. It comes from the uh, situation that Orban, according to me, and Orban's regime is a sub-sovereign mafia state. He was uh, uh, bribed, corrupted by uh, by Russia, Russia. And if you once, through corrupt mechanisms, belongs to a patron client network, you cannot leave it. This is why he he he, he uses this policy making favor for Putin and otherwise because because uh, uh, according to my nation, until Hungary gets EU funds and there is no. There is, uh, uh, there is ensured its impunity uh, still within the EU, then until that time he wants to be in the EU with Hungary. If not, then he would like to get out the country from the EU because he knows the fate of Yanukovych, of Gruevsky, of Blahotniuk, uh, and he does not want to flee alone. He would like, he would like to take out of the country. And, uh, and, and I think it's, it's because of this position. But even that, uh, let us say, Erdogan shows some signs of this patron autocracy, 
but he is just balancing and he is using this situation uh, just gaining on this war as much and, and playing a game when he has good relation with Ukraine, with Russia, uh, 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 with, uh, with uh, United States, with European Union and with others as well and, and then uh, uh, slowly uh, uh, expanding uh, uh, Turkey's influence in the region. Well, thank you for the responses. I will just have a Parthian error, because actually all the countries which are patronal autocracies, we can uh, mention also Xi Jinping, which actually is driven into that direction. No. Erdogan, we can no. take... See, 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 no, uh, in the, the China is an absolutely different case. Uh, China is a market exploiting dictator. But it is building and developing the new patrimonial relations into the system right now. Uh, the problem is that they are fighting now against it because it's, it's a real danger for them, uh, the so-called privatization of the Chinese Communist Party. And this is what the, the, the mafiaization, mafiaization of these Chinese. And they are fighting against this. This, this is a real problem. Uh, these uh, <coughs> anti-corruption campaigns uh, sometimes described uh, 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 just as, uh, as uh, uh, ensuring the leading position of uh, uh, the actual uh, party leader in China, and partly it's true uh, that, it's, uh, that it's targeted against uh, rivals. But on the other hand, on the other hand, there was such a change, for example, that, uh, that uh, uh, until a few years ago, the, <coughs> the uh, attorneys, uh, uh, prosecu uh, prosecutor authorities were subordinated to the regional party leader, and now these authorities uh, were taken out the surveillance of regional party leadership and were centralized. This is now a problem again because it's not a stable system uh, uh, when you create a, a wider and wider uh, the market uh, part of the economy, and of course uh, you can use bribes all the time, and it's uh, uh, culturally embedded in the in this Chinese culture that uh, that you represent your families in this. Then the danger that the Communist Party will fill up, uh, fall apart uh, for different patron client networks uh, is uh, is is a is a is a real danger. So therefore, I think uh, they are not a, they are not a patron autocracy in that sense. Uh, and, uh, and I think that Russia also, uh, during the war, from a patron autocracy, is starting to move towards a, towards a market exploiting dictatorship, which is not, of course, but still better to be characterized by patron autocracy, but there is a move towards the direction. Well, just to finish about China, still under Xi Jinping, it is much more closer. The move is toward the personal autocracy uh, than it used to be with, uh, for example, Jiang Zemin. Yes, but, uh, but uh, uh, if you would compare that uh, Orban and, uh, and, and his wider family uh, 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 and his uh, front man, uh, 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 how large share of the Hungarian economy and certain branches are controlled by personally them and is their ownership, uh, you could not compare it with Xi uh, Jinping, any family member, or any. You, you know, so so you could not imagine what should it mean in China. You know, to have such a large share of the of the economy under the under the uh, uh, <coughs> discretional uh, authority of, uh, of of the chief patron, what what we have in a in a patron autocracy. Okay. Well, thank you. I was a bad policeman, and now I think we have to pass uh, the word to the. Public. Yeah, please. I have two questions. Uh, first question is about uh, does your uh, model uh, have a regression and progression uh, dynamic? For example, uh, about uh, Czech Republic. For example, we have Czech Republic that uh, have moved from liberal democracy to patronal uh, democracy. To pull and back. And, 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 and back. And, 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 and so, so, so in, in the Babish government, uh, uh, they started to go into that direction, but it was stopped. And, and especially that party, that party shows that, uh, that his employees were uh, leaders within this party, is, is typically such a thing which goes into that direction, but it was stopped. Because there was no, pat uh, there was no patronal uh, breakthrough. He could not reach a patronal breakthrough if he could. That, that, that. I mean, I mean, what is the sign of progression? Pardon? What is the sign what this move? What is the sign of progression of a society? For example, um, it's not like um, a very bright uh, example. For example, if we talk about Russia, when it moved from uh, democracy to the paternal autocracy, uh, yes, the does the conditions for uh, ordinary man or woman getting towards when we uh, when we have a country moved from 
know, those countries uh, which are presidential republics, they have a better position, easier position to be transformed into autocracies. Into autocracies. And, uh, <coughs> and for example, the peculiarity of the Hungarian patron autocracies that from a pure parliamentary system it was created. It's a, very, it's a unique thing, this, this character. But <coughs> Orban patronized first his party before the Fidesz. The Fidesz was patronized uh, when he lost the election, uh, even in the middle of the 90s, but later uh, finished this patronization process uh, after 2002 when they uh, lost the elections after their first government. It meant that, the, that in the party constitution, they accepted that the party leader itself was responsible and had the right to appoint all candidates for the national elections, for the parliament, all candidates to be mayors, and to, and to set up the party list for these elections. Not anybody of the party could do it. And even symbolically later, uh, uh, the, the, these candidates uh, uh, were received by him personally on his ranch, you know, and, and making the deals, you know, and then everybody is dependent, uh, was dependent from him personally in this party. Uh, so he did, what happened with Hungary, it happened before with the Fidesz. It's a, it's a unique situation with the Fidesz. And then uh, uh, with this uh, uh, crisis in Hungary after 2006, 2008 world crisis, financial and a lot of things, the bad governance of the socialist liberal governments, corruption, some corruption cases, the, the world economic crisis, financial crisis, etc. Altogether, these separated, uh, separated features of this crisis resulted uh, that he could gain, with the help of a, a very disproportionate election system, the two-third majority in the parliament, and such a way could introduce it. The, the road of, of, uh, uh, of uh, Putin was also a different one because he, from a low ranks of the KGB and some other uh, co uh, uh, criminal elements, uh, and, and later with FSB and, uh, and, and, the, and this, uh, partly with his presidential power, etc., uh, he needed a lot of years until he reached this, uh, reached this position to. Uh, uh, to stabilize, practically until the war uh, stabilized his uh, patronal, uh, patronal autocracy. And again, in Central Asian countries, it was a royal road, I think, from the, from the local uh, KGB leader becoming a, a chief patron uh, uh, or the local party leader transforming himself into a, a local chief patron. Uh, it's also another road. Uh, the end of this road, now uh, in a patron autocracy, we can see that the same, but uh, this is why we in, in secondary, trajection, secondary trajections, we make different rules because it's, uh, they can differ from each other. But this is I, uh, uh, what is the problem, what, uh, what uh, 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 this 3D model cannot be screened now, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, normally if you have just a liberal democracy and communist dictatorship, or democracy dictatorship exists, then if you compare the position of Poland and Hungary, you, know, you would see that, let us say, Hungary is here. If you put it, it would be here, and Poland would be somewhere here. And, and then it should just represent a false idea that they are on the same track, they are, uh, 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 they are on the same line in transformation being from, from liberal democracy towards an, uh, uh, towards an autocratic or dictatorial, uh, dictatorial regime. But they are very far from each other, uh, practically the nature of them. They are absolutely different autocracies. And the, and the mainstream language, just concentrating, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, uh, my presentation, concentrating only on the political institutions, they cannot grab this. So even the word what we use, you know, politician, I think in patron autocracies there are no politicians. You see, entrepreneur. It's a question. Who is an entrepreneur? And who is an oligarch? An entrepreneur normally disposes over his property. But in a patron client network, he does not dispose it over, over his property. He, uh, he's in a patron client network. His property can be taken away any time. He's, a, in this slide, a client, a servant within this chain. Of course, he, he can use it, et cetera, et cetera. But, but what part of it can be used, you know? So even the words, even the uh, corruption, it does not work at all. 
does not work at all. You know, this is uh, what happens when EU comes to Hungary and tries to give advices uh, to a mafia state, to a criminal state, how to fight against, how to fight against uh, corruption. This is something like uh, then, uh, if you would like to teach a lion to be a vegetarian, you know, so it's, it's absolutely nonsense. And this is why you are captured by bad words which do not describe the given phenomenon. Another question. This is a problem of, 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 of the uh, past dependency, you know. When, I, uh, when we spoke about this, that uh, in the first hidden axiom, that the uh, uh, separation of uh, spheres of so social actions is completed or not, as you go from Western societies towards the East, you see that they are more and more interwoven. So you, you, so you cannot change it directly. So this is uh, this is a problem in the case of Ukraine also. So it's, so it's uh, 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 hard to introduce a new culture. What kind of institutional building is uh, necessary? Or what you have to do together? So not just separated actions, but somehow concerted effort uh, uh, for changing this uh, patronal character. It happened, for example, to some extent. Uh, there is a positive uh, example in Georgia, but. Strangely, it was accompanied of concentrating political power to fight against the patronal character of the society. This was Saakashvili's uh, problem later, you know, and, 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 and uh, but, but still, uh, the level of that type of corruption diminished there, but, but they managed it such a way that during Saakashvili, if I know well, that uh, 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 a lot of young Georgians were brought back from, from Western firms and Western institutions, and they just how invaded the uh, public institutions and uh, uh, tra tried to transform them. And Hungary is another way, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, uh <coughs> it's a bad example, uh, uh, because uh, uh, if you compare the different cultures, very simplified way we write about in our book, the communist countries belonging to Western Christianity, countries belonging to Orthodox Christianity, and to Muslim cultures, as you go from one to the other, then you will see that you won't find liberal democracies already among those who belong to the Orthodox Christianity or to the Muslim cultures, you know. And, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, in the, those who belong to the Western culture, you will find now, as an exception, Hungary as a patron autocracy, but more liberal democracies, more liberal democracies, because you cannot jump over very easily uh, historical uh, uh, historical phases, and especially the communist regime. When we were speaking, uh, when we are speaking about that, that the uh, uh, separation of uh, spheres of social action is not completed, then in a communist regime they are practically merged. They are practically merged. So, 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 so it's even in those countries uh, uh, where it had some development already in this uh, uh, Western uh, direction, uh, they were stopped. Well, I think it's a good point to finish with. I invite the audience to give a huge applaud for this interesting presentation. <laughs> And I'm th I, I, I would like to thank to everyone who is watching us, who was watching us. It was a global mind for, for Ukraine. As you can see, we invite great intellectuals to discuss huge problems. Stay with us.